and welcome to this talk on impulses to innovation, the 3D printed response to the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, thank you for coming. This webinar will be recorded and will be sent around later via the email you registered with. Um, my name is Kate Doyle. I'm a member of the IMECI Yorkshire Process Industries Division, and I'll be chairing this event and moderating the, Q moderating the Q and A at the end. Um, our speakers are Kevin Askew, who is a business development manager at Additive X, an additive manufacturing company, and Stephen McElroy, who produced personal protective equipment with his 3D printer at home during the beginning of the pandemic. Um, this presentation will look into home and industry 3D printing and their responses to the PPE shortage in the first weeks of the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, you can use the chat box to ask questions throughout the talk and we will try and get through as many as possible at the end. So I will now pass it on to Kevin. Good morning, everyone. I will just share my screen now and um, we'll kick off the event. So thank you everyone for attending. Um, so um, we are looking as it is at 3D printing response to the COVID-19 pandemic. So um, when the pandemic initially struck, um, there was a sharp increase in people contacting a lot of 3D printer resellers or VARs as we're called, value added resellers, um, to ask for assistance with the COVID-19 and printing um, parts. Not only were those people um, owners of 3D printers, but there was a lot of university and hobbyists contacting us to ask about printing face visors, as well as um, healthcare, um, including uh, GP surgeries and um, pharmacies, as well as hospitals, um, asking for um, interim PPE um, protection um, in the form of, of visors. So um, there was, I say, the initial spike in a number of organisations, which everybody will be aware of, requiring face shields. Um, no official guidance was actually released for quite some time about what these face shields should look like. And there were a great number of, of um, open source designs around on the market. Um, speaking from our personal experience, we held off a little bit in producing face visors until we understood what was required. Um, we were also asked by a number of companies about can tooling be made for injection molding very quickly um, to fulfill that stop gap. But 3D printing really came into its own in this point to um, be uh, the number of printers out in the marketplace versus the number of visors um, or, or head um, bands that could be produced really did help a lot of people. It was no, by no means enough to fulfill the entire PPE requirement, but it was um, a very good, quick, short turnaround and showed the power of additive manufacturing for being able to get parts out um, quickly, but also then exposed that, yes, we can't do really large volumes unless we all work together and create a, a community of people all working in the same direction. So the, the designs, uh, the number of designs released to the market um, did vary, as I've mentioned, and we were speaking to various healthcare professionals. Um, and it was soon discovered by talking to the hospitals and the pharmacies, etc., that various face shields and face visors were suitable in certain environments. Um, it'll come to no surprise to some people that the less material on the face visors, the quicker they were to print, so the more we could get out to the marketplace. Um, so you will see from the image here, the orange um, face shield uh, was used in frontline workers for hospitals, etc., which stopped any moisture or droplets from sneezes or coughs going down the front of the visor into the eyes. Um, the other face shields were used um, on places like reception desks and pharmacies where there was that little bit of a gap between, um, let's say, customer or patient and, and employee. Um, so they offered that bit of further protection and were far quicker to print. Um, and Stephen will run through how he printed um, his face visors, but we've got a number of machines in house and we were printing um, these across all of our 3D printers um, in the facilities. You can see just on the uh, screen there some visors that were hanging up in some um, plastic bags. So when we were printing the visors, we were uh, or, the, or the head guards, we were then actually putting on 
the plastic coating uh, we were sterilizing we were then putting into plastic bags and sending those out uh, to site especially if they were for front workers or front uh, frontline healthcare workers so when we were looking at the the way we were printing and how many we were printing we were really led by the suitability of design as i said the less material we can use for printing the quicker they were to print versus the uh, the orange face shield um, on the other picture the previous picture which took a lot longer to print but was safer overall for let's say frontline workers we also started to then look into materials um, were we printing in plastics such as PLA which tended to be um, if they were in a, a really frontline environment were one use because they couldn't be sterilized or were we using materials such as PETG which then could offer a level of sterilization and could be used again so again there was that conversation of do you start printing five visors for one use or do you start printing one that could be used five times um, and it was that way up between what the customers wanted what there was demand was driving um, and we tend to go for the one with the the uh, cover across the top um, and the, 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 the um, sterilization so it could be used a few times over uh, the quantity of face shields required versus the 3D printing capability. As I've already mentioned, um, there is a trade-off between quantity and speed, but um, it really led to um, industrial and community to cooperation. So the sheer amount of 3D printers such as Prusas and Crealities, so your sub 500, 600 pound printers out on the marketplace, were doing a brilliant job. Um, they were the, the owners of those machines were buying plastics or having plastics donated or setting up um, funding streams um, and they were um, getting materials and printing off vast numbers of face shields. So as mentioned, it wasn't ever going to compete with injection molding. Um, we can't do the sheer numbers that they can, but our time frame from request to actually being mobilized was very, very quick. Um, and the, it was really, it was a really nice kind of feel, um, although um, as, as awful as the pandemic was, it really did show how communities and industry can work together and cooperate in order to get these um, face shields out to the people that were requiring them. So as, as well as face shields, which was the kind of high level um, PPE discussed um, on the news and um, in various other sectors, there were a number of other uh, COVID-19 related products that were 3D printed, and I'll touch upon those um, in a moment or two. But also we then started to look um, at the recycling of materials. Again, I'll come on to this, but the University of Hull with the uh, Aurora Centre, the AURA Centre, um, are, are were becoming a 3D printing recycling hub. And um, we joined forces with them a little bit in terms of uh, looking how this could be done because we'd worked on a previous project, recycling filaments. Um, so that was recycling 3D prints that had already been printed, rechipping them, repelletizing, and then extruding back into filaments. Um, so there were a number of uh, closed loop um, recycling projects on the go. And this again fed into that um, on the back end. So considerations um, that we were looking at were the recycling of waste materials, as well as what we were using to print up front for one use and sterilization. Um, the plastic use and recyclability was high on a number of companies' agendas. So although a lot of people were crying out for face shields, um, a number of people were saying, what happens when my one use face shield is finished? What do I do with it? And that really depended on the type of plastic we were printing in and the type of environment it was being used in. Um, I don't know if we were a little bit more cautious with being um, a commercial entity. We didn't really, we were unsure if there was any comeback in any way, shape or form. So we were being careful about, um, I, is it being used in high COVID, uh, areas of high COVID levels, which means it would have to be disposed of in clinical waste. Um, could it be, was it being used where the owner could take it home and, or, or could wash it at work very easily um, and reuse it? As I said, in um, places like the, um, the receptionist in doctor's surgery or if you had a screen up at a pharmacist but still required an extra bit of protection, um, then this meant that there was different 
different masks and different materials for different purposes. So as I've mentioned, the Aura Centre at the University of Hull became a national hub for 3D printed waste. Um, and you can see there that they are working with 3D crowd communities, gathering in plastics, um, washing those plastics, re-chipping or melting those plastics and then producing um, their own filament, um, which I believe they are printing with um, at the moment, just to try and stop the sheer amount of um, one-use plastics going into, into landfill. So where else has um, 3D printing been used in the pandemic? So there was a big rise in a material called copper 3D um, and they produce a plastic which has uh, copper in, um, infused into it. So um, biologically very good for um, viruses um, to, to die on it quite quickly because I'm sure most people are aware the coronavirus doesn't live very long on copper. Um, whereas it leaves a couple of days on other surfaces. So this Copper 3D company, we were printing in that material for things like door handles, door openers. Um, and also there were a lot of people who were wanting personalized door openers. So you can see on the image with the little hook on the screen, uh, we were sending a number of these out that had been printed on powder machines where people literally were just hooking them to their key rings and were then opening various doors with them. And there were, again, a number of designs of these parts. Some were very specific to different companies. Others were multi-use, so could open or could fit multiple door handles um, in order for people to not have to touch that particular surface. Another area where a number of companies, especially on the resin 3D printer side, and we've mentioned Form Labs because we work very closely with them, but they were really leading the field on the nasal swabs. So they were producing um, 324 nasal swabs in 11 hours, so approximately 650 a day from a single printer. So you can imagine those companies with uh, Form Labs print farms with multiple machines were printing off. This was mostly in the US, if I'm honest with you. I've not seen a lot of this in the UK, but in the US, they were their Form Labs were heavily involved in 3D printing um, of nasal swabs. You can just see on the picture there one of the Form Labs print beds um, with all of those nasal swabs printed upright on it. So it just shows you how you can fit the uh, amount of swabs on the print bed in, in 11 hours. We personally didn't get the call to do that, but we have got around 10 Form Labs machines in our facilities working away, um, both as demo units and for producing benchmarks. And um, if it did come to the point where we would have been asked to have print nasal swabs, we could have done quite a, a quite a large turnover, um, again, as a, as a stopgap to be able to um, fulfill the need for, for nasal swabs. So the response to the pandemic wasn't just printing PPE equipment. It did disrupt supply chains. It did cause um, a lot of other issues globally. And a number of um, 3D printer manufacturers have kind of, as well as, as well as commercial companies, have stepped back and thought, right, okay, how can we look at this and um, negate any future um, supply chain stoppages? This could be pandemic related, or it could be going back to just what happened a few months ago with the Suez Canal um, blockage. What can we do to start reviewing and looking at disruption to that supply chain? And the likes of Mark Forged and Form Labs printer owners now do have access to COVID-19 files. They are locked away um, on their software um, and are easily accessible through a toggle of a button, which I'll touch upon um, in five minutes or so. But a lot of um, different companies have then started to look at producing parts on 3D printers as part of a digital inventory. Um, not necessarily to be used all of the time in replace of the supply chain. Some people are doing that, but others are using it as just as a, a, a what if, as a, as a backup. Um, and can we produce parts that will suffice till the original, um, original equipment manufacturer, the OEM part, comes in? Um, again, it correlates and runs very nicely in parallel to what happened during the, the, the initial um, pandemic of the face masks about the injection molding companies being able to tool up to get the um, PPE molded um, 
then we are looking at certain companies being able to um, I say use that as a stopgap to produce parts till um, other um, other um, problems in the supply chain have been negated. Others are using it fully for producing parts and removing parts of the supply chain completely by bringing that in-house. Um, again, we've seen that with a number of hospitals who have purchased 3D printers for various reasons. Um, some of that being they have got them ready there to produce parts um, for their staff in future should there be another outbreak and they require very quick um, access to printed parts. So I'm saying these files are still available on certain platforms. So this is an example of the Mark Forged um, Iger platform. So you will see the we've got there the um, the library of parts um, that we can print. So that that is the digital inventory. And what we've done is just done a very quick video to show how easy it is to access their COVID nineteen file library, which is in the background. But you can imagine this then. Um, being introduced for any other supply chain problems um, in future. Hopefully there won't be any, but you can imagine how that would then um, kick into action. So we've now got um, here where we can go into the organizational settings. Um, we can toggle on include COVID-19 library in the tab. We go back to our library and now we there we've got our COVID, sorry for the background noise. We've got a COVID-19 library there and you can then start to see that the file will build and it's ready for printing there now. So now it is that easy to access files um, in the background of their software, and we can toggle that on and off um, as we need it. And again, um, we can do that for their form labs, um, nasal swabs. We've got their files saved, so we can just quickly upload those in there. So following on from that, and as I was saying, it's made a lot of um, companies review their supply chain. The state of Michigan have gone one step further with Mark Forged, and this has all come around um, from the pandemic. And the state of Michigan have now um, invested in over 200 Mark Forged desktop 3D printers for um, engineering companies within the state of Michigan. And they've um, connected them via a blockchain enabled cl a cloud function. Um, which will allow them to produce um, parts for future pandemics or for future supply chain shortages. Um, so you can see there that they've got the 200 printers. The state of Michigan, because all the printers are cloud connected, have overall control um, and can step in by using that toggle function of being able to access files very easily. And the project is poised to become the world's largest emergency response network for 3D printing. So when I say that, that's actually an official network, an organized network. Um, what I was saying earlier is the um, community network from um, the people who had 3D printers at home is huge and really did a, a great job during the initial stages of the pandemic. But it hasn't made um, the state of Michigan sit up and realize that there could be future uses for 3D printing. Um, it could well step in as a short term supply chain, um, uh, covering supply chains to cover resiliency and give flexibility. Um, and those manufacturers that are participating in that um, diamond project, as it's called, are able to use the 3D printers for their day to day operations um, with the overriding knowledge or agreement that the state of Michigan could step in and commandeer their printers at any time. Um, in order to negate any future um, supply chains. So that's my presentation. Happy to answer any questions at the end. I will now pass you over to Stephen. Um, just my email address is there if anybody would like to make contact. And I'll now stop my screen share and pass you over to Stephen. Thank you very much. Thank you, Kevin. That was uh, very informative. I will just get my screen sharing set up. Hopefully everybody can see that. Uh, so as Kit said at the start, my name is Stephen McAvoy. I'm a, a system engineer at Sellafield Limited, the new nuclear reprocessing plant here in Cumbria. Uh, and during the first lockdown, I was at home, furloughed, uh, and I'd bought myself the 3D printer I'd been promising myself for quite a few years. As I'd seen prices had come down and I, I knew I was going to be stuck at home. So very new to 3D printing. I um, 
I thought I, I started to look up what I could make, what was out there, and and so on, and uh, very quickly ended up producing a lot of these. So um, I'll start off with some of the things I think are really important qualities in in engineers. Um, obviously, you have to be resourceful, inventive, um, progressive, or forward looking. Uh, a key one I really think is innovative, and and this is something that the IMAG are really pushing at the moment. There there are podcasts. Uh, magazine articles, YouTube videos, um, and, and this, this series of webinars uh, on the subject of innovation. Uh, and I think it's a really key thing. And these days with so many modern technologies moving so quickly, uh, it's it's a really fun time to be in, in engineering. I also think being motivated to help people is, is quite important. Um, and collaboration is is a key thing and another thing that has been really really useful uh through this pandemic as as kevin said about even the state of michigan starting to produce this this network but through the informal means and through social media uh the the benefits of collaboration have, have really come to the uh fore uh and also, I think engineering is quite vocational. So a lot of people will have hobbies related to engineering, which in the last few years has been the explosion of 3D printers. Um, my own 3D printer, it's a, a Creality Ender 3 Pro, which is the um, the starter 3D printer that just about everybody buys. I think I paid 150 pounds for it. Uh, I've spent probably the same again, upgrading various parts since then, but it, it's it's very cheap and it's, it's now very reliable. Um, of course, the the Amagi strap line on the magazine is improving the world through engineering, which, which is what all of these different qualities really push for. I think. So the um, as Kevin as I already talked about the uh, some of these different face shields, uh, Prusa were one of the big ones. Um, the National Three D Printing Society N Three D P S was was one that I um I got involved with quite early on. So I'd um I produced a couple of initial ones of the Prusa one, that's the top right one in the picture that you can see. Um, I like that, it was a really good strong design, but it had a couple of potential problems that I could see, which were it needed to be made in two pieces. Um, there was a, a, a sort of bottom part of the frame as well. And the clear part of that visor had to be uh, laser cut or something from, from stock sheet. It was a non-standard size. So I then started to see some of these other much leaner designs, which could make use of a standard A4 clear sheet, which are readily available as binder covers or uh, that sort of thing. You can get a hundred pack of them for 10 pounds. So, so I, um, I started to produce some of these for the National 3D Printing Society. It was a really good scheme. They had some, some really clever people running it. Uh, they were getting lots of printers on board and, and things were moving very quickly. There were a few design changes early on. So everybody got, got printing in earnest, but it, it it became a thing that the the once they had their their um, lines of, of delivery and logistics and everything sorted, there was a minimum order quantity of, of two hundred frames to make it worth their while. So you could fill a box with two hundred, they'd send it off. At my current rate of production that was going to take two weeks before any of these shields that I was printing would even leave my spare room and, and potentially it could be another week before they'd they'd be worn by anybody. So I um I thought whilst I'm producing them I will put a little post on my local Facebook group to see if I can offer any out locally and get them out a bit sooner. And the response was um I think the best word to describe it is explosive. Uh, with I, I could I could not keep up with the number of messages I was getting. So so it very quickly turned into a, a, a local mission. Um, I, I started producing them. I realized how much it was going to start costing. Um, with this design, I was able to produce 50 frames from a kilogram roll of PLA, which is about 20 pounds. So really, really cheap, uh, including all the, the, the clear sheets and everything. It was costing about a pound each to produce these. Um, um, and within within maybe two or three days, uh, the, the Northwest Ambulance Service had an order. Um, a lot of the local GP surgeries had them. Eventually, it, they, they did start to go into hospitals in the less critical areas. As, as Kevin was saying, they had these much, much 
more op optimal um, designs with the the shield on top of the eyes for within surgeries and within COVID wards and so on. Um, but these were PLA given to them under the proviso that these are not you cannot sterilize these, but you can you can scrub them with warm soapy water, and that will should kill COVID on them. But they're not they're not medical grade. They're they're very much better than nothing as an interim thing. Um, but the the majority were delivered locally here in Cumbria and Lancashire, um, delivered in person by me as quickly as, as possible. But we did get in, in contact through those Facebook posts and through sharing with uh, a few people um, within London and some of the hotspots where there was a real shortage. So, so some were sent down there. And also Little Island, uh, Jersey, I think had about 20. We sent about 20 down to them. Um, purely because they didn't have anybody making them locally, so so we tried to help where where we thought it was needed most. Um, and in the end, there were well over two thousand uh, ordered and, and delivered. Not I hasten to add, not just from my little Ender three. I um, will go on to that with collaboration. Um, so within within the first week or so, I had contact from Lancaster University where I finished my master's in mechanical engineering about 18 months ago, so about six months before uh, the lockdown. Uh, some of the local firms, BAE Systems, Playdale Playgrounds, uh, Furness College, all got involved, got in touch, offered printers, offered help, offered staff, offered money, really, really helpful. Um, so within a few days, we had, I think, eight different people running printers uh, and a a good friend and colleague of mine who had been looking for an excuse to buy a 3D printer for quite a long time, much like I had been, he uh, he bought another similar printer, an Ender 5. You can see me building on my living room floor. Um, as soon as that arrived, he uh, he loaned it to me for, for those few weeks, just as long as it was as long as it was needed, really. So within within a week or so, I was coordinating and producing, I think it was about 150 a day or thereabouts. Uh, with optimization and sharing all these designs and and collecting and distributing and and so on, but collaboration was was crucial. I I could have helped some local GP surgeries on my own, but in terms of producing some of those bigger orders, you can see you can see quite a stack of them there on um, one of my collaborators' kitchen tables. Some of those guys were able to produce silly amounts uh, compared to my little creality. But these these hobby printers. At 100, 200, 300 pounds each, have come on so much in recent years uh, that they're producing stuff reliably, producing consistent, good quality, um, not to the same standard, obviously, as as what the likes of Additive X can produce, um, and and certainly not producing parts for ventilators or any high spec stuff like that. But for this job, as a not the optimal solution, but better than nothing, they were a lifesaver. I don't think that's uh, too much of a stretch to say that. Um, and then through the Lancaster University network, I was also contacted by people from as far afield as Australia that were that, that had seen press releases about what was what was going on. Um, I wanted to get involved and wanted to sort of know about what files we were using, what the difficulties were, any feedback, what what printers to use, what settings. And this was all stuff that was so easy to share via email send files across and help get people started elsewhere it was it was a really really good collaborative effort and um, so i sort of talk about why why this did work because it was a very different approach to how these larger companies such as additive x have had to to do it and um, there's minimal set of time and cost as i said the, the printers themselves are are cheap and um, mine was 150 pounds you can see some of the some of the extra bits and spare parts I'd been I was fitting one Sunday afternoon because I did have a few breakdowns early on. Um, I have improved a lot of parts since then, uh, and it is is a much more reliable printer now. Um, minimal logistics, as I say, originally the National Three D Printing Scheme were using uh, a large courier firm with it, trying to get a contract set up to help get everything to a central point and, and distribute where it was needed, but but I was really just delivering within a 20 mile radius um, during lockdown. Uh, in terms of red tape, obviously there is 
there is a hugely important part within that of, of liability of um, keeping people safe, but not providing dangerous equipment. Um, but as a as a well-meaning private individual, it was it was very much a case of getting these on people's heads because it's better than nothing. As long as they understand that it is not perfect and it is better than nothing, whilst the sort of um, injection molding designs are being finalised and the CE markings going through and, and that set up time to produce millions, this was very much a, a stop cap. Um, so it met the short term demand for I think maybe four or five weeks, something like, like that. And it was it was very agile. So there, there were a few design changes um, proposed through the that scheme. Um, and I followed those through until it got to the point where where the design changes seemed to be adding more material purely so that they could meet CE approval. Um, I, at that point, I, I wanted to keep it as lean as I could, keep producing 50 of those from every roll of filament uh, and get, get them out as fast as I could so I could produce one in 30 minutes on even on the basic printer. Um, so at that point, I was I thought the design was, was pretty much optimized. Um, but yeah, simple printer modified for a bit of reliability and a bit more output. Um, so there's just a few weak points that if anyone wants to ask me about them, I'm happy to uh, to talk them through if they're looking at buying one. But it, the end of three is is ubiquitous. They're everywhere and, and there are so many forum posts and YouTube videos and things on how to how to improve and modify them. Um, it's a really good starting point. So that is, in a nutshell, my uh, presentation. It was quite quite short, but I'm happy to um, take any questions. Um, I will just make a point that the next webinar in this series, Impulses to Innovation, uh, is on the 15th of October, and that is Michael Bradley, who will be talking about um, some air hoods, uh, which are a quite an innovative thing um, through this this last lockdown, and we have another date which will be confirmed shortly, which will be in November this year. Um, so yeah, if there are any questions, please uh, send them to me or Kevin in the chat. Uh, thank you for that, um, Stephen. Um, we have a first question. Um, did you receive any funding for materials? Uh, I did. So within about 48 hours of, of starting to produce these, uh, I had a couple of suggestions from people that they wanted to help out with costs. So I set up a Just Giving page and received a couple of larger donations uh, in the hundreds of pounds from a couple of local firms. Uh, and a lot of smaller donations from local people. So so that added another layer of having to keep on top of, of these and obviously make sure that, that everything was, was tracked and so on. So um, once once all the filament had been purchased and the postage had been paid for to send it out to various people I was working with and, and so on, um, there was just over a thousand pounds left over. So that was donated to the local Morecambe Bay NHS Trust charity. Um, I'm not sure how how Additive X funded theirs, and I'll pass over to Kevin for that. But yeah, I had a sort of crowdfunded, I suppose, the, the modern way of doing it. So we, we were on the flip side of that, Stephen, if I'm honest with you. So um, no, we didn't receive any funding, but we did um, assist others. So we provided free of charge materials um, in a lot of cases to people that were asking. And the um, masks that we printed um, using the materials were obviously free of charge as well. So um, yeah, we weren't charging for anything, if you like, that was specifically COVID related for people that we knew that were printing um, face masks. We, um, we we did donate a lot. And I uh, said so the face masks we printed were all donated free of charge as well. Um, thank you for that answer. Um, to a question for you both, do you have any recommendations for anyone wanting to get into 3D printing as a hobby? I'll let Stephen answer that if that's all right, because we um, the, the machines we sell start at around the two and a half, three thousand pound price point. 
um, and we are more kind of industrial slash education focused than hobby focused. So, um, I mean, as Stephen was saying, the Creality machines and the Proust machines are are very good, but they are very good in our opinion up to a limit. Um, and then that's where you start to have to flip over to the more professional um, machines. But Stephen, if you would like to pick that up, that's all right. Yeah, of course. Um, so I'll speak from my own experience because I, I obviously realise there is there's a definite limit. I've I've been using three D printing in industry uh, to produce prototypes and, and finished parts and so on for about ten years, um, but only got into it as a hobby last year. Um, as as the prices came down, I know I look, I've looked at it for the past five or six years, and a few years ago you could spend a thousand pounds or more and have a really small not particularly useful printer and um, and it's it's in the last sort of year or two that i think that that the likes of these creality and Prusa machines have have improved and have, have come out it, it's now quite easy to um to buy something that will work out of the box in in a fashion but they do have quality problems or they can have quality problems so there are a number of things you can do to to improve that um so if you're like me and you you don't mind fixing things and, and tinkering, I would definitely recommend start off with a cheap one. Um, so the likes of your Creality Ender 3, Ender 5, something like that, you can buy for a couple of hundred pounds um, and you can get kits of things to improve them. So you can upgrade your plastic extruder to metal parts um, to avoid any slippage on your, on your filament. Um, you can improve the quality of the, the extruder tube, the Bowden tube. Um, you can Put different nozzles and hot ends on. It's all quite cheap to do. You can fit a glass bed to get a perfectly flat surface to print off because some of the heat pads have a little bit of a warp in them. Um, so I would definitely start to look at something like that, something that enough people have bought that there's a there's a load of knowledge out there and there's a load of spare parts and improvements that you can do. You can fit quieter fans, you can upgrade circuit boards, uh, you can control them by Wi-Fi with webcams. It's all it's all out there if you're willing to play around with it and improve it. And that's, for me, that's part of the hobby as well. I, I, I'm sure you would agree, Stephen, it's, it's not a plug and play solution <laughs> a lot of the time. <laughs> so I, I, I think 3D printing is, is the term, whilst it's it's really made it accessible, it's a bit of a double-edged sword. A lot of people think it's like buying an Epson inkjet or a Yellow Packard inkjet printer and then plugging it in at home. and. And the way you go, you're producing your items. So as you've rightly said, there, there is a level of tinkering. There is a level of failure. And there is a, a bit of a learning curve. Would that, yeah, would you agree? Yeah, oh, absolutely. I, I would kind of, though, in my own experience, the um, my my now wireless control of my, my 3D printer is more reliable than the wireless 2D printer that I have. <laughs> Fair enough, yeah, after a bit of tinkering. Yeah, absolutely. Um, okay, we have a two-part question, kind of. So, have you recorded your mistakes while manufacturing non-profitable face shields? And what steps have you taken in order to account for to improve the manufacturing? So, we, we, we didn't record um, any mistakes, if I'm honest with you. Um, we, as I said in our presentation, we hung off initially to see what face shields were required. And then we, we well, that was only for about a week or so, then we, we did kick in. Um, but I, I suppose we might have been too hesitant in terms of being wary of any comeback or anything. But as Stephen said, we did say to people, this is to assist, it's not to fully cover. Um, for example, my own sister works in the NHS and she contacted me and said, could you print some face masks off for us? And she's not, she, although she, she works in an um, occupational therapy team, um, then we did so um, for them. So no, we didn't, we didn't record any, any mistakes or anything. What was the second part of that question, please? Yeah. Um, Kate? What steps have you taken into account in order to improve manufacturing? So we, we did, although we weren't, although we didn't kind of take into account from uh, from mistakes. I mean, we were well versed at three D printing anyway, which I'm sure you would expect. Um, we did start to look at how parts could be printed better, um, and we, we we looked online and we we seen posts and we thought, you know what, that's interesting. There was one person who was using um, 
a printer that I seen that had two print heads on it and they were printing um, visors that were easy to separate from each other so they didn't have support structure in the middle. So what they were actually doing, I believe they were printing in ABS and high impact polystyrene and they were printing a visor in, in ABS then another one in HIPS and another one in ABS. So they separated from each other very, very easily. Um, so there was, they, they minimized their time um, actually taking support structure off certain areas if they were printing in a big stack. Um, other people were getting around that by the type of um, visor they were printing um, anyway. But um, yeah, so um, we, we did we did learn, we did look at modified designs, we did our own designs, but we worked closely with a lot of the printer manufacturers as well, and we we used their their designs to print off their their three D printers. I don't know if you've got anything to add to that, Stephen. Uh, yeah, I think on on that same question, uh, from my point of view, the uh the steps taken in order to to improve the manufacturing um initially if, if you sort of go with your, your default 3d printer settings um you'll you'll uh choose the number of shells or, or um, walls that you you print with and and then within within that you'll have an infill pattern um because often to get the, the properties you want it doesn't need to be a solid part but if if you try to produce a solid part it the, the printer spends a lot of time zigzagging and rastering and so on so one of the one of the first things that i read about to um, to improve that was was to produce a a solid part but purely by producing lines so the printer is is working in in straight smooth lines all the time uh, which was the biggest thing to to reduce time spent printing these uh, frames but also reduce wear and tear on the machine as well it's not hammering backwards and forwards and, and stopping and starting all the time so that was probably the the key thing that brought time down from somewhere between an hour and a half and two hours per, per part down to 30 minutes or so. Okay, thank you for that. Um, we have another question for Stephen. Um, Victoria did something very similar with a local visor printing group and one of the problems she faced was getting hold of clear PVC binder sheets which were in very short supply and expensive for a few weeks at the peak of the crisis. Um, did you have the same issue? Uh, yes, definitely. Um, I had ordered quite a, what I thought was an optimistic amount early on. Um, I think I ordered a thousand and within sort of a week or thereabouts that was, that was dwindling. So I had to, uh, to find more and yeah, the, the, in that sort of week, the price had, had just about doubled. Um, I, I did manage to get some when I needed them, but I was also in contact with um, Sellafield, my, my employer. They have a, an innovation centre that was working on a similar design and had a contract with Canon for all the uh, photocopying and so on within the company. And they were providing them with a lot of clear sheets. So I had that as a as a backup if it was needed. Um, but I did manage to get a supply as much as I needed. Um, I probably still have a couple of dozen sheets <laughs> somewhere. Uh, but yeah, yeah, that that was a difficulty. Um, getting getting the uh, the filament was quite tricky at times as well. A lot of places where I might have ordered five rolls and got everything dialed in quite nicely with that material, and then the next time you go to put an order and you couldn't get that material anymore, and it was a little bit of a difficulty. So yeah, um, definitely the the. The speed of the uptake of, of this was uh, a bit of a shock to the supply chain. And of course, at that time, trying to get any any stuff like that from the likes of China was not happening either. So yeah, definitely difficulty, but uh, managed to uh, not not dry up the supply completely. Um, thank you for that. Uh, I don't think we have any more questions at the moment. Um, so yeah if that's all the questions then thank you everyone for coming to the talk um, this will be sent round via the email you registered um, with and um, yeah thank you for attending thank you thank you everyone